desperate to get out of it with her school. Mm -hmm. Well, mom didn't know she got that maternal shot. And that second one, she went down on the flight. Well, I was Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome as we are now uh, in our fifth midweek Lenten service and we continue our look at just how great God's love is. You follow the order of service of prayer and preaching as it's printed in your worship folder. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice, rejoice and be glad in it. For the rising of the sun to its setting, the, the name, name of the Lord, Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. focuses upon the Praetorium. This is the place where Pontius Pilate held court. When they had bound Jesus, they led him from Caiaphas to the Hall of Judgment and gave him over to Pontius Pilate, the governor. It was early. They themselves did not go into the Judgment Hall so that they not, might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, what charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Then Pilate said to them, Take him then and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. So the word of Jesus was fulfilled, signifying by what death he should die. The charges they brought against him were, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. <coughs> then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Do you say this for yourself or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Do you take me for a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have given you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would have thought that I should not be given over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. I was born and I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? 
After he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in this man. The chief priests kept laying one charge after another against him, but he answered not a word. Pilate questioned him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many charges they lay against you? Jesus answered him, Not a word. Pilate was utterly amazed. He said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no case against this man. They pressed their charges more vehemently. He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he belonged in Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him on to Herod who was also in Jerusalem for those days. When Herod saw Jesus, he was delighted, for he had long wished to see him because of what he had heard of him, and he hoped to see him do a miracle. He questioned Jesus repeatedly, but he gave him no answer. The chief priests and scribes stood there and vehemently accused him. Herod and his soldiers mocked him, they put on him a splendid robe and sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that same day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You have brought this man before me as one subverting the people. See, now I have examined him before you and have found nothing in this man guilty of any of your charges against him. And neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Mark this, he has done nothing worthy of death. I will have him punished and release him. Now at the feast, it was the governor's custom to release to the crowd any one prisoner whom they asked for. There. They had then a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. He was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection in the city. Pilate knew it was out of malice that the chief priest handed Jesus over. Therefore he said to them, Do you want me to release to you Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? The chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask, for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Pilate asked them again, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they cried out all together saying, away with this man and release for us Barabbas. While Pilate was sitting in the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Do not have anything to do with that man. I have suffered much over him today in a dream. Again, Pilate addressed them, for he wished to release Jesus. He said to them, what shall I then do with Jesus, who is called Christ? What should I do with him, whom you call the king of the Jews? They all cried out, crucify him. Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found no guilt worthy of death in him. I will therefore punish him and let him go. They cried out all the louder, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers of the governor led him away into the praetorium. They gathered the whole band of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a purple robe on him. When they had woven a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. They knelt down and did him homage. Peter went out again and said to the, or Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I bring him out to you that you may know that I find him not guilty. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. 
When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I do not find him guilty. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know I have power to crucify you, and I have power to release you? Jesus answered, You would not have any power at all over me unless it had been given to you from above. For that reason, he who handed me over to you has the greater sin. This, pro this prompted Pilate to go on trying to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but rather a riot was underway, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this man. See to it yourselves. Then all the people responded, His blood be on us and on our children. Then Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, gave sentence that it should be as they demanded. He released to them Barabbas, for whom they had asked, the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. He had Jesus flogged and then gave him over to their will to be crucified. The soldiers mocked him, stripped him of the purple robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. This is the passion of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, he, he was, was delivered up to death. death. He, he was, was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death, and he was delivered for the sins of the people. This evening, our look at the Catechism focuses on the Fifth Petition and Luther's Explanation. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. What does this mean? We pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look on our sins or deny our prayers because of them. We are neither worthy of the things for which we pray, nor have we deserved them. But we ask that he would give them all to us by grace. For we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. So we too will surely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. We join to sing our theme hymn, O Love, How Deep, How Broad, How High. It's number 544.
Jesus, our Lord, and our Savior. In considering the dimensions of God's love last week, we talked about the forgiveness of sins being the greatest gift we could receive, and God displaying his rich love for us by bringing his forgiveness to us in a multitude of ways. This week, we're going to taste the, take a fast and flying tour of the many ways that the Bible describes what God does with our sin when he forgives it. My hope is that you'll be assured and grateful for just how abounding God is in love and rich in mercy. When your sins are forgiven in Jesus, it means... God looks on you with favor, and come what may, he will warmly welcome you into his kingdom for Jesus' sake. To what can we compare getting rid of our sins? This deepest and most desperate need to one who uses every means possible to get rid of a yard of moles, rodent poison, menacing looking traps, flooding them out and whacking them over the head when they come up, gassing them with exhaust from a car. This is kind of like our God. In his great love for us, he gets rid of the guilt of our sin in just about every conceivable way. But our need to be rid of sin before God really can't be compared to the nuisance of moles in a yard. So to what are we to compare it? The frantic need to be rid of a cancer growing within you? Well, that's closer. <clears throat> the need to be something or the need to be doing something about a huge asteroid that's rushing straight to the earth on its way to obliterate the earth well that's maybe even closer but the need to be rid of our sin finally there's nothing that compares with this need to be rid of sin to be rid of guilt before god and to have it removed. There's nothing also that we can compare with the joy and freedom and the blessing that comes in Jesus when God grants us full and free forgiveness of all our sins. Our text is Micah chapter 7. Who is a God like you? who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our fathers in days long ago. This book isn't all sunshine and daisies. God sent Micah to rebuke his people for their injustices and their unbelief. The rich were oppressing the poor. The political rulers and the religious leaders had become corrupt and greedy. 
The people had turned aside to false gods and false hopes. Micah warned God's people terrible judgment was coming. And come, it did. During Micah's lifetime, the northern kingdom of Israel was wiped out by invading uh, foreigners. And the southern kingdom of Judah nearly also fell. Yet, scattered among Micah's strong warnings and threats are repeated announcements of hope. A new king will be born in Bethlehem of Judea. All the nations of the earth will stream to the God of Israel to know him, to learn of his ways. God himself will take the great problem of his people's sin into his own hands. So, what about all their sins and iniquities? What will God do with these sinners and their sin? He will display the greatness of his love in this. He'll grasp their sins and throw them to the ground. He'll take their enormous sins and trample them into nothingness under his even more God-sized feet. Have you ever heard anything so wonderful? In Jesus, God has done it. He has trampled upon and stomped into nothing every shred of your sin and guilt. Micah adds another totally wonderful description of God's forgiveness. He has taken your sins from you, hurled them way out into the ocean, so that your sins have sunk down into the depths, never to be mentioned again, never to be heard of, never to separate you again from God and his enormous love. Isaiah tells us, Jesus has borne our sins. He's carried them. They were way too heavy for us. So God lifted them off of our shoulders and placed them on Jesus. He's carried them as a sacrificial lamb. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is like that scapegoat in the Old Testament. Once a year, the high priest would confess his own sins and the sins of all the people, laying his hands upon that head of that goat. The goat would then be sent off into the wilderness, carrying the sin and the guilt along with it, far, far away from the people. It's a picture of the way God deals with sins, of how God has dealt with with our sins for our benefit in Jesus. God has taken our sins and nailed them to the cross. That's what Paul says in his letter to the Colossians. And we could add that God has buried our sins in Jesus' tomb. When Jesus rose victorious, our sins didn't rise with him, but they remained buried in that tomb forever. Micah says, God has removed our sins from us and cast them away, all of them, into the depths of the ocean. The Psalms say something similar. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us and cast them out. As far as the east is from the west. If you were to check Google Maps for the distance between St. Louis and Kansas City, it would tell you it is 248 miles. If you were to check the distance from um, Pittsburgh to Portland, you would find that that is 2,571 miles. But if you were to ask Google Maps how far east is from the west, well, let me share its response. <clears throat> Sorry, 
we could not calculate the driving distance between um, East Elementary School Jackson and West Africa. Now, even if you were to just go and Google it, it would bring you to a discussion of this very passage from Psalms. Through the saving work of Jesus, the Messiah, God has removed your sins far, far, far away from you. Consider some other images the Bible shares of forgiveness. Galatians 3.27 says, We sinners have been clothed with Jesus so that our sinful gar garments are covered over and can no longer be seen. Isaiah says, God has decked us out in a robe of righteousness. Jesus' death for you is an atoning sacrifice. And that biblical word atonement also has with it the sense of covering over. Acts 22.16 says, God has washed away your sins. Isaiah exclaimed in terror when he looked upon the Lord, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord. God has made you pure and clean from head to toe because of Jesus. And that's how he's going to see you at the great judgment, as Paul says in Ephesians 5. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Other passages say that God in his mercy will refine his people. Like gold or other precious metals, metals that have been corrupted with impurities, God's forgiveness is like a fire which burns away all that's worthless and foul, namely our sins, and leaves something precious in its place. God also blots out our sins. God keeps books. In his righteous judgment, he warns that the wicked will be blotted out forever, <laughs> that they will be erased from the book of life. But in his great mercy, God assures us for Jesus' sake that he has taken his pen in hand and lots of ink, and he's blotted out all record of our sins from his books. David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. God not only blots out your sins in his books, he also blots out your sins in his divine mind. Jeremiah foretells with joy that day when God, having sent the Messiah, will forgive the people's iniquities and remember their sin no more. This, in my opinion, is the best way the Bible talks about God and how he forgives sins. He truly forgives and no longer remembers. Because of Jesus, he will never mention your sins again. The holy God and your great offenses and sins. What will happen when one encounters the other? Don't picture God simply sitting there perfectly still as a judge upon his throne, whom you must stand before trembling at the judgment. The Bible paints for believers a much different picture. Our God abounds in love 
and mercy. It's overflowing. He doesn't sit still at all, but he energetically deals with your sins in Jesus. If God has carried your sins, nailed them to the cross, buried them in Jesus' tomb, trampled them underfoot, hurled them into the ocean, removed them from you as far as the east is from the west, covered them over, clothed them with righteousness, washed them away, purified them, blotted them out of his book, no longer remembered them in his mind and declared them gone. Guess what? They're gone. You can be really, really, really sure they're forgiven. Your sins, which once stood between you and joy in God's presence forever, they're gone forever. What remains between you and God is his enormous love in Jesus forever. Amen. Now may that peace and love of our God that passes beyond our comprehension guard and protect our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our wonderful Savior. Amen. We offer up our response as we join in singing the hymn, Come to Calvary's Holy Mountain. It is number 435. <laughs> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift, the divine peace and a pardon. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
mercy for those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the sick and dying, for those who are who mourn the passing of loved ones, for all those who care for them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Finally, for these and all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins, where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Amen. We close with the hymn, Christ the Life of All the Living. It is number 420.